evacuating for drones and just all of this coming together. So the war is almost like a collective effort. But let me ask this question him. Yeah. What is percentage of the vehicle they unit mm. got from supplied by the army and mm. what by volunteers? Yeah. By my opinion, he said, seems to me that everything for the vehicles like uh, like uh, for the like off road vehicle of the small vehicles including the vans for evacuating like medical teams 100% was supplied by volunteers in their unit There, so all the spans, like for electricity, using electricity, they do, uh, yeah, you are in do it. Uh? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. like, like uh, electricity, water, they paying it from their money. The the plastic mm. Russian mm. Mm. own money mm. from mm. their salary, not from for from our. Ah. Wow. My other friend, mm. you will meet him. It, they die does the same. They paying, yeah, five hundred USD a month for one apartment, two or three rooms, just uh, to be <coughs> nice. They didn't want to like use abundant. Yeah. They wanted to respect people's property, realizing that maybe if Russians will not stop, Russian will do the same with that place as they did with. Marinka, they did with Bakhmut. Mm. So it's amazing how many Ukrainian soldiers self-fund. This is the account of me, Jonathan M. S. Pierce, an author, philosopher, reporter and YouTuber. A man who ironically has MS in his name as well as MS in his brain. Stem cells, wow! It's been a long journey from receiving stem cell therapy in 2019 for my condition to being someone so obsessed with the war in Ukraine that I found myself travelling a loop in the war-torn country just behind the front lines. We continue the journey, moving north from where we were in Kyiv, on the battle bus with my newfound friends. Pierre, a British humanitarian aid worker working out of Kramatorsk in the east of Ukraine. Greg, an American pastor who has been running aid into Ukraine for 26 years with his Ukrainian charity partner and the minister, Zhenya. We are an unusual collection, ranging from a non-believer in the back to two very much believers in the front. When I, when I pointed philosopher, she said, oh, that's cool. <laughs> actually, I think actually so. what I he think said so. was, he's not cool. Know, but he's a wannabe, but he's a really... Our first port of call was the Sumy Oblast, Oblast being a region in Ukrainian, in the northeast of the country, some four and a half hours from Kyiv. After spending several hours getting to know each other, we eventually arrive in the city of Sumy, where we meet someone from the unit stationed near the border. We followed their car to where we needed to go. This was my first experience of checkpoints, or block posts as they're called. Of course, with filming being prohibited at them, we recorded no footage of the countless block posts through which we filtered. Eventually though, we had to drive in almost darkness with rear lights blacked out and headlights on minimally. We stopped just shy of the Russian border. It was active there, being within artillery and drone range. The day before, the unit had been struck by a drone and lost two people. This was not a time to be blasé with safety. Incredibly, there was a guest house that was open in the middle of the woods. I can but imagine that Greg and Zhenya when visiting to give aid to the unit here were the couple's only guests existing as they did in a war zone with no prospect of attracting passing tourist traffic. 
It makes you wonder how many different businesses, how many lives have been upended, the length of the border, the length of the front lines. And as I record this now, the units along the border here have moved back some 10 kilometers, back past this guest house, due to the incessant bombing of the border regions with guided glide bombs. I wonder what has happened to the guest house owners. The lights stayed dimmed, the curtains firmly closed. We didn't want to attract drone attention. A soldier with the call sign Fish turned up with freshly cooked food from where his unit was stationed. We were suitably impressed. This then became an opportunity for us all to have a live stream from the guest house, asking questions to Fish and raising awareness of the unit's needs. The whole trip to Ukraine was one that would sit within the remit of reporting from where we were, of detailing the experiences we were having and the needs of those who we met. Between the four of us, a camera, a laptop, a streaming device or a mobile phone were never far away and often they were all being used in unison. Greetings, everyone. I think we're live um, tonight. No studio, no big computer, uh, no light, but I need to make sure we're live first. So let me make sure we're live. Oh, we are live. Beautiful. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's nice to see all of you guys there. Marino, I see you there, and John. Hello from South Wales. Was good seeing Johnny from ATP has arrived. Will be great to see Fish again. Hello. She <laughs> done. That's Fish and uh, Mitch Ashdown. Welcome to you, John Larkin. Welcome to you, Kay Bell over there in Australia. Welcome to you. Um, yeah, the volume is going to be a little low because tonight, guys, this is about the level that we can talk at. So. We have, as you can tell, gotten to fish. Richard Bennett. Okay, sound okay. For the love of God, can someone give JP a cup of tea? <clears throat> so I have, I think I was thinking about a call sign, right? So everyone has call signs out here. And Pierre asked me earlier what my call sign was going to be. I was thinking philosopher. I was thinking that's a bit swanky. I'm not going to go philosopher. And then I was thinking we've been on a journey today to try and find some oat milk that I can have in my tea. So I think my call sign should be oat milk. <laughs> okay, his, his call sign is oat milk. So what I'm going to do is put him on the first train to connect to the first plane out of here. <laughs> tea bag or oat milk. <laughs> All right, let me get some more messages here, guys. While there are frivolities here to engage the audience, we also deal with the serious nature of the war at hand. Though in the same way, we try hard to get the engagement with the very people we are hoping to help. It's important that the audience make connections and empathise with those Ukrainians fighting so hard for their and our benefit. And what came across so strongly in talking to Fish is how he was, prior to the war, just like any of us, a hard-working parent with a beautiful family that he so desperately wanted to protect. As both a reporter out there and an atheist philosopher, speaking to soldiers in what is quite a religious country was an excellent opportunity to do some rather different reporting. One of the articles that emerged from my experiences in Ukraine concerned speaking to a Ukrainian soldier the very next morning in the guest house over breakfast. I wrote an article titled Crosshairs, a Christian fighter in Ukraine and the question of God in war. I very much did not want this to be an attack on someone's religious rationale for fighting in a war with and killing other people. I was seeking to understand rather than to challenge. I'm pretty happy with the results. What shone through was the very humanistic nature of the reasoning of the soldier to whom I was speaking. Even though we had two very different worldviews, had my country been attacked and my family been threatened, I would have used very similar reasoning in taking up arms. So talking about him personally, I'm quite interested about his faith mm -hmm. and how that works with, you know, being a soldier. How does he 
justify, you know, mm -hmm. killing Russians yeah. or how does he justify going to war in terms of how he understands the Bible or his faith? Yeah. First few weeks we've seen what they were doing in Bucha and Irpin. When the three years boy was raped, and the girls, small ones, adults, I, I don't even touch it. They were, this was it like their nature, this is what they showed who they are here in Ukraine. So I get this picture that I have a nice woman, like a nice uh, wife, sorry, mm -hmm. beautiful wife. He wants to show it. Mm -hmm. Daughter, the beauty. Mm -hmm. And I had that picture realizing that they will do the same to them. No. And if you will read the Bible just, let's say, one-sided way, <laughs> like meaning straight, meaning like, okay, if like somebody slept, you know, on the left cheek, put the right one, this way I, I just would watch, I would need to watch and bless them, no. The soldier was not prepared to turn his cheek. As an atheist with my own family, there was nothing here that I would disagree with. This was, as far as I'm concerned, a very human reaction. In protecting Ukraine, these soldiers are valiantly protecting their loved ones, their families and friends. The desire for Putin to eradicate Ukraine's identity, its culture, its language, its history, is at best to revise people's sense of who they are and where they are from, and at worst, to outright eradicate them. Like Jesus was saying that there is no bigger love than giving life for your friend's life, for your friends. Right. Being ready and yeah, putting your life for that, like paying with your life. Yeah. And this is the um, like understanding what what, lo what love is that way. Mm. That you, you may talk a lot, but your acts will show your real attitude to your people around. We are people who are able to think, to analyze. It's, it's not me, was me who came to them to be a, even do a robbery. I'm protecting my family. I see those forests and I don't care which, which region is it, Sumska or Khmelnytsky. I'm coming in the film. It's all of it, it's mine. It's mine. I cannot have this, this kind of attitude. Okay, this is so people of Kherson or people of Sum, Sum, it's there. It's those people. It's all of it, it's mine. So, and this is my inner nature made me to come and fight. This fascinated me as there was a real sense of universal humanity, dare I say humanism, that was underwriting his behaviour. Although there were other religious justifications also given, it seems that these desires to protect his own from aggressive outsiders was something we all had in us. There is more that we have in common than which divides us. In speaking to all the people I did in my time in Ukraine, soldiers and civilians alike, in hearing motivations like these, or being described war crimes committed by the Russians, my convictions about who is right and who is wrong in this war were only strengthened. My moral evaluations of this war were very strongly validated. The next day the four of us drove down to meet a unit working from a house in a border village. Unfortunately for a good number of the people and places we visited we were unable to record much footage for reasons of operational security or OPSEC as it is known. We were consistently well within artillery and drone range here, something that leaves one looking to the sky more often than not. 
It was a crisp, cold day. The skies were clear. Perfect for drone activity. We were welcomed into a house to meet the unit. Sitting in the kitchen, we listened to their experiences, their hopes, their fears. One of them, a drone operator, spoke perfect English. I gleaned a number of things from this engagement. First, with units like these, 100% of their vehicles came from donations. Imagine that. Imagine with the National Army from wherever you live. This was the case. This war must be the first in history that has been so vastly crowdfunded. The revelation led to another article that emerged from the trip. Crowdfunding a war against autocracy. We're not talking just pickups here, but drones, bullets, medical supplies, metal detectors, power packs, armoured vehicles from private dealers. The role played by the national and international public is not to be underestimated. Yeah. Hey guys, as you can see, in fact, a donation came in like last night, I got the email. Uh, somebody, and I'm sorry, I can't remember everybody's name now, but uh, sent $550 to purchase a new metal detector for a unit. And look at here, guys, we're delivering them all over the place. And we want to say thank you. So as you know, we're in the process of the big A drop now. And today we're dropping metal detector here to save these guys lives with them to do their job to stand up for Ukraine and to stand up for you. So thank you for what you're doing. Just stick with us. You're going to see it all delivered. Uh, step by step. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There were three things that the drone operator said were his concerns. One, that the US would not provide aid. And now, at the time of recording six weeks later, US aid has been stuck in Congress for six whole months. Two, mobilization. The Ukrainian soldiers realized the desperate need to get boots on the ground. And three, the need for Ukraine to continue innovating to stay ahead of the game. As I say, this is a conceptually easy war to win. Ukraine just needs stuff. Lots and lots and lots of it. It's not hard, it just takes money and political will. Allies can do this while helping to ramp up their own and Ukraine's own indigenous production. If Ukraine can dynamically respond to battleground needs with continued R&D with help from the West while working to solve personnel issues, the war can be won. Getting an insight into the feelings of the troops on the ground was a gratifying experience. Since recording, however, the unit has moved 10 kilometres back, behind where the guest house that we were staying in was located. The building is now in the grey zone, even though it is this side of the Ukrainian border. Why? The dreaded guided glide bombs that the Russians are littering the border and front lines with. The solution? A ton more stuff. Air defence units, munitions, just more stuff. Soon we were on our way, but not before getting my removable crampons on. This was the first and last time I was more mobile than the rest of the merry bunch on this trip. You've got to take your victories when you can. We were on the road again, heading for Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv. That evening, as the snow fell outside, I would be busy creating my usual daily update videos for the viewers to get a handle on what was going on in Ukraine. But this time, I was actually there to give a slightly different angle. The following morning, we went for a coffee. Well, a tea in my case. Planning the next part of the trip was challenging, given the Ukrainian electronic interference active in Kharkiv, used to confuse incoming drones and missiles. Share, send your current location, accurate to six meters, okay? I'm sharing. It says that we are in the park, in the forest, you see? And probably... 
We are in Pisochin. It's not a Kharkiv. Kharkiv is right here. That's amazing. Yeah. This is why we get screwed up a lot. That's why we get So I decided okay, you can do it from your phone now. We decided to follow our noses rather than Google Maps to hit the Novoposhta post office, a private service that has admirably kept Ukraine ticking over. Greg and Jenya needed to send some aid somewhere and so we dropped in. So here is Nova Poshta in Kharkiv, which is the private uh, postal service that does an amazing job in getting stuff to the front lines. It's a real integral part of keeping uh, Ukraine moving. But I thought this would be a point of interest for you. This is a point of invincibility. Now these are shelters that have been built uh, as sort of bomb shelters to protect you from missiles that often rain down on Kharkiv and inside here you have heat and electricity obviously you don't need to be staying here for in here for too long so if we come in here you see it's fairly basic but you've got your seats there you've got heaters up there which are at the moment warm this is genuinely warm in here you have power banks or, or sockets there, a bin, a water cooler with no water, so I'm not sure how useful that is. But yeah, so that is your point of invincibility. That is nice and warm. I might stay here. Um, so these have been built in response to the consistent attacks on cities like Kiev and Kharkiv, where, uh, you know, people don't necessarily have access to bomb shelters quickly that have been previously built, like Soviet era ones and uh, underground metro stations and, and things like that. So they build these in strategic locations to protect people. I do, you know, it'd be interesting to know exactly what would happen to a place like this if an S-300 missile, you know, directly hit it. I mean, could it sustain that kind of damage and therefore yeah it makes you wonder but these are purpose-built for uh, protection from those sort of munitions and whatnot anyway here we are here's Pierre JP, you need to stay slightly rippled yes I was wondering about that protect, um, you know, the blast. really so that that's a design feature that yeah, rippled you'll see, side you'll see the more exaggerated in that in Kramatorsk right interesting while in Kharkiv, I remembered that one of my YouTube channel supporters and someone whom I had interviewed and streamed with a number of times, Matthew Bishop, had previously lived in Ukraine's second biggest city. At the beginning of the war, the British Australian escaped Kharkiv with his Ukrainian wife and child as the Russian war machine rumbled on and ever closer. They travelled to Romania and eventually found their way to Australia. A little reminder of his previous home was on the cards for him. Hey Matt, this is for you buddy. This is big love from Kharkiv. I hope everything's all right with you. Thanks for all your support buddy. Big love. Love you Matt. In the next part, we'll be moving further to the south to a town called Izium, the site of a heartbreaking war crime. In the meantime, I'll leave you with this. And for the record, I'm no gun-toting Second Amendment advocate, but we were in a country at war. Can you um, pass me my camera, please? It's in the bag. Can you take it out? What have you got there, JP? An interesting camera. Is this one?